Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. And I'm very happy now to continue our reading and discussion of the book Code Word Barbalon 2 by P.D. Stewart. Get it from LuxVerbi.org. That's L-U-X-V-E-R-B-I dot org. Check out the other online booksellers, bookstores around the country. This is a must-have book. And as you'll see as we continue reading, I'm telling the truth. Continuing in the chapter entitled Caesar's Demise, Antichrist Arise, we're on page 106 in the book, if you're following along. And we were talking about some of the most reputable Christian, uh, early Christian teachers and theologians. Tertullian and Hip and Augustine of Hippo, just to mention only two, all admitting that the Pope was Antichrist, or that which replaced the Caesars of the old pagan Roman Empire, would be the rise of Antichrist. And that could be no, none other than the Pope of Rome. Here's a quote from St. Augustine of Hippo, who lived from 345 to 430. For what does he, meaning Paul, mean by, quote, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work? Only he who now holdeth, let him hold until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, unquote. I frankly confess, I do not know what he means. However, it is not absurd to believe that these words of the apostle, quote, only he who now holdeth, let him hold until he be taken out of the way, unquote, refer to the Roman Empire. And if it were said, quote, only he who now reigneth, let him reign until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, unquote. No one doubts that this means Antichrist. That again from one of the most revered doctors of the church, Augustine of Hippo, clearly predicting the rise of Antichrist immediately upon the heels of the secession of the Holy Roman Emperor, the Caesars. Now, continuing where we left off, <clears throat> this continues now. Even Pope Pius IX, who reigned from 1846 to 1878, gave this remarkable testimony linking the ascendancy of his church to the fall of the Roman Empire. Quote, it is, therefore, by a particular decree of divine providence that at the fall of the Roman Empire and its partition into separate kingdoms, the Roman pontiff, whom Christ made the head and center of his entire church, acquired civil power. Unquote. This, again, by Pope Pius uh, uh, the Ninth in the Apostolic Letter, uh, entitled Cum Catholica Ecclesia, dated March 26, 1860. So here we have one of the most authoritative popes of, of, of recent time, Pope Pius IX, and you'll remember that he is the one who wrote the encyclical and syllabus, it called the syllabus of error that damns the United States and its form of government because it doesn't answer to the pope. This same pope clearly said that it was at the fall of the Roman Empire, and you can take that mean to mean the fall of the Caesars, that the Roman pontiff, the Pope of Rome, gathered in his civil power, in other words, attained civil power. In other words, he took the seat of the Caesar. He now sits in Caesar's seat and has all of his authority all of his temporal and civil power. That from a pope himself. Now, here's another church father. Uh, here's what another church father had to say about the matter. Quote, 
we have the consistent testimony of the early fathers from Irenaeus in the 2nd and 3rd century, the disciple of St. John down to Chrysostom, uh, about the years 347 to 407 A.D., and Jerome from 347 to 420 A.D., to the effect that it, that is the restraining power, that which was holding back the rise of Antichrist, was understood to be the imperial power ruling and residing at Rome. Unquote. And this could be none other than the Roman Caesars. And H. Grattan Guinness, the famous church historian, concurs, quote, While the Caesars held imperial power, it was impossible for the predicted Antichrist to rise. Unquote. And the respected and renowned Tertullian, about the years 160 to 225 A.D., wrote this, quote, He who now hinders must hinder until he, that is the Roman Caesars, be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which, by being scattered into ten kingdoms, shall introduce Antichrist? Unquote. Even John Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople in the year 390 A.D., tells us in his homily on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that, quote, There is one that restraineth. That is when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way. Then he, Antichrist, shall come, unquote. Chrysostom, like many others, uses the word he to refer to Antichrist. But, of course, we now know that the Antichrist is a tag team. A woman or a world church with a very powerful man at her side. The son of perdition. The two being joined together like man and wife. How's that, reader? Is that proof enough? that Paul was speaking about the fall of the Caesars and immediately thereafter the rise of Antichrist, that it was the pagan Roman Empire, the, the pagan Roman emperor that was restraining the rise of Antichrist, and that immediately when the Caesars stepped down from their temporal throne, the bishop of Rome stood up in his place thus fulfilling the prophecy centuries ago. Antichrist is not a figure in the distant future. Antichrist is a figure in the distant past, and he continues to this very day. And he will continue until the return of Christ, or shortly just before. Now... Continuing, said John F. Coulthart, quote, As civic powers of pagan Rome waned, the popes gradually gained in authority. Pope Gregory the Great, from 590 to 604, assumed very great power, and others followed on. Tiring of the restraints of the Byzantine rule, Pope Leo III turned to the Frankish king Charlemagne, and on Christmas Day of the year 800, crowned him head of the Holy Roman Empire, which some wit remarked, quote, was neither holy nor an empire, unquote. American Catholic Quarterly Review of April 1911 tells how the popes of Rome came to succeed to the seat of the Caesars, quote, Long ages ago, when Rome, through the neglect of the Western emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection and asked him to rule over them, and thus commenced the temporal sovereignty of the popes. And meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the vicar of Christ took up the scepter to which the emperors and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages, unquote. And that should be enough to, to convince even the most skeptical mind 
that the papacy fulfills the prophecy of the of of the apostle Paul who said he who now letteth will let until he is taken out of the way and we have catholic historians the most renowned catholic historians we have popes themselves we even have official roman catholic publications that admit this very thing we see it fulfilled in history with so much testimony to to verify it that if one were to argue he would defy his own credibility now if the catholic pontiff took the seat of the caesars what is the pontiff but a caesar himself so we still have a roman caesar today and because the pope is also a religious leader and not just an emperor time magazine has called his kingdom the quote empire of the spirit unquote that's what they call the pope's kingdom in time magazine empire of the spirit and i only have to ask my listeners what spirit that is my little note that i made to myself here in the bible is the devil because the dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority as we see uh, in the scriptures themselves now continuing he says the elegant and learned adolf harnack says of this development quote the roman church pushed itself into the place of the roman empire of which it is the actual continuation the actual continuation. The empire has not perished, but has only undergone a transformation. The pope who calls himself king and Pontifex Maximus is Caesar's successor, unquote. That from the work entitled, What is Christianity? Page 251. Another historian, Hobbes, I believe, says the same, adding his own witty touch, quote, the pope's fitted the place of the vacant emperors at Rome, inheriting their power, prestige, and titles from paganism. Constantine left all to the bishop of Rome. The papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. For so did the papacy start on a sudden out of the ruins of that heathen power. Unquote. Since then we have had since then we have had the ghostly fathers enthroned in the Church of Rome. As historian Abbott wrote, quote, the transfer of the Emperor's residence to Constantinople was a sad blow to the prestige of Imperial Rome, and at the time one might have predicted her speedy decline. But the development of the church and the growing authority of the Bishop of Rome, or the Pope, gave her a new lease on life and made her once again the capital, this time the religious capital of the civilized world." Unquote. It's interesting to note that even in the marginal notes of the Geneva Bible, we read this, quote, "...the beast signifies the ancient Rome of the Caesars." Unquote. So we see that the papacy, that is papal Rome, as we call it, and the church controls the woman, uh, the church it controls, that is regarded as the woman in the scriptures, acquired the wealth and power of the Caesars on the demise of the old Roman Empire, the beast, upon whose back the church rode to power. Even to this hour, the head of the papal church, the pope, has his seat of government in the old pagan city of Rome. Indeed, the remains of imperial Rome are still to be seen on every hand at that ancient city. Thus, the old saying, the old saying still holds, as does the prophecy, quote, all roads point to Rome, unquote. But the papacy, knowing it had no genuine claim to the empire of the Roman Caesars, and incidentally, in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, actually laid claim to succeeding from the Roman emperors 
but created a fiction, which they later translated into canon law, namely the forged document they called the Donation of Constantine. And when we get to the book, uh, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, a book that I've waited since I began this program some four years ago, when we get to that book on this program, we're going to deal a lot with the, the donation of Constantine and the pseudo-Isidorian decretals, all these forged documents that the papacy has used to prove her legitimate authority as the temporal power of the world, as being the Caesar of the world. They've taken what are unanimously regarded as forged documents. And they made them a matter of canon law, Roman Catholic canon law. And you must believe, on pain of excommunication from the church and eternal damnation, that these documents are authentic when they're universally regarded as forgeries. The very basis of the papacy is based on forgeries and lies. Now, continuing, it says, in the famous painting of Raphael, the kneeling Emperor Constantine is seen handing Pope Sylvester I a statuette of Roma Eterna, which means eternal Rome, symbolizing the transfer of power from the Emperor to the papacy. But all historians, and I say all, have since confirmed that the document was a massive forgery commissioned by the Pope. No such official transfer ever took place. And in this book is, a, is a, a photograph of that painting of Pope Sylvester seated on his throne and, uh, 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 em, and uh, Roman Caesar Constantine down on one knee paying homage to the Pope and handing him a statue, a statuette that represented the Roman Empire. He's literally handing the Roman Empire to the Pope, to Pope Sylvester. And this is celebrated at the Vatican as being testimony to that which the papacy has always claimed for itself, the divine right to, to rule over the civil powers. The author continues, he says, The above painting details the alleged donation of Constantine as depicted by Gianfrancesco Penny. In the, in the Sala di Constant, uh, Constantino, and it says the kneeling Constantine is seen handing Pope Sylvester I a statuette of Roma Eterna, which means eternal Rome, symbolizing the transfer of power from the emperor to the papacy. On February 23, 1520, about four years before the Raphael's painting of the donation was completed, Protestant reformer Martin Luther, in a letter to Spalatin, wrote this of this papal forgery. Quote, I have at hand Lorenzo Vallis' proof that the donation of Constantine is a forgery. Good heavens, what darkness and wickedness is at Rome. You wonder at the judgment of God that such unauthentic, crass, imprudent lies not only lived but prevailed for so many centuries that they were incorporated in the canon law and became as articles of faith. I am in such a passion that I scarcely doubt that the Pope is the Antichrist expected by the world. So closely do their acts, lives, sayings, and laws agree with the predicted imposter." Unquote. It is most interesting to note also that the Roman Catholic Church has even adopted the titles and order of hierarchy of the Roman priesthood. Quote, The priests among the Romans did not form a distinct order of citizens. The Pontifex Maximus, or high priest, was a person of great dignity and authority. He held his office for life, and all other priests were, subject, were subject to him. The Vestal Virgins were females, consecrated to the worship of Vesta, unquote. Today, the Pope calls himself Pontifex Maximus. The lower order of priests are subject to him, while the Vestal Virgins, or the nuns, are consecrated to the worship of Vesta, who, under the Popes, 
has since metamorphosed into the Virgin Mary. Henry Shepherd, fellow of Oriel College, Oxford, confirms the Madonna of the Sun, or Our Lady of the Sun, was just another name for the pagan goddess Vesta. Now, my dear reader, says the author, are not these similarities remarkable? So let us cast away any uncertainty we may have about the reliability of Bible prophecy and using the part, the part of the apocryphal calendar or compass as we have identified in this chapter and according to the measure of intelligence with which a good and beneficent God has favored us. Let us proceed to the investigation of these mysteries, invoking always the wisdom of the Father of Lights and applying the key he has given to unlock the remainder. For, says the Lord, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it, unquote. From these parenthetical remarks on the history, let us turn to the prophecy and we seek to unravel the hieroglyphs of Antichrist. Now, reader, I'm aware that some may object to the severity of my language in the coming chapters, but I ask, as did William Lloyd Garrison, quote, Is there not cause for such severity? I will be as harsh as the truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write in moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the woman to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen, but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. I will be heard. Unquote. For to quote Garrison once again, quote, the apathy of the people is enough to make every statue leap from its pedestal and to hasten the resurrection of the dead. Unquote. And that is the end of chapter 16. We'll proceed now to the, the beginning of chapter 17, if you're following along the book, page 114. It is entitled, The Mystery Woman That Sits on Seven Mountains. It begins with a quote from Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. And here is the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Unquote. The author begins by saying, I will now explain, before proceeding further, the hieroglyphic of the woman who sits upon seven mountains as brought to view in Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, and who is described as having a golden cup in her hand in Revelation chapter 17, verse 4. When we get back from the break, we're going to continue to discover who it is that is described in God's holy book, in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, who is this woman described in chapter 17? If you know anything about the Roman Catholic Church, you'll recognize her. We'll be back right after this. Now, the mystery woman that sits on the seven hills. This author, P.D. Stewart, is going to show us from the Scripture how this woman can be positively identified. He says, quote, Here is the mind which hath wisdom, unquote, says the Scriptures. Quote, the seven heads are seven mountains, unquote. It is significant to note that this verse says one requires a mind which hath wisdom. 
to decode the meaning of the woman and the seven heads or mountains on which she sits. This is telling us that we need to apply our minds to the passage in order to fully comprehend it. No casual reading of this passage will do. It requires wisdom and intelligence. Now let us first use our intelligence and look up the word Vatican in a good Latin English, English Latin dictionary, or even in the encyclopedias. When we do so, we will learn that Vatican City and St. Peter's Basilica were both built upon the Vaticanus Mons or Vaticanus Colus. Now, if we use some wisdom and look up the words Mons, M-O-N-S, and Colus, C-O-L-L-I-S, we will find that they mean hill or mountain. Even the Catholic Concise Oxford Dictionary states that the word Vatican is derived from the word Vaticanus, which it confirms is the name of a hill in Rome. And the Catholic Encyclopedia states this, quote, It is within the city of Rome, called the City of Seven Hills, that the, the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confined, unquote. Septimontium, a Roman festival, was held in the month of December. The day was a dies ferutus for the Montani, or the inhabitants of the seven ancient hills, who offered sacrifices to the gods and instituted to commemorate the enclosure of the seven hills of Rome within the city walls." Unquote. There's also a collection held in the British Museum consisting of an ancient Roman coin called a Cistercius, minted at Taraco in 71 AD during the reign of Vespasian between 69 and 79 AD. This coin declares Vespasian to be Pontifex Maximus, the very title later assumed by the popes. The coin also depicts the city of Rome as a goddess and has her seated on seven hills. Originally, quote, independent settlements existed on the Quirinal, the Esquiline, the Capitoline, and the Saelian also. These hills, with the citadels upon them, were places of refuge also, in case of necessity, for the settlers upon the adjacent plains, and at the very early date, all these hills, settlements, were fused into a single city, Rome. There's your seven hills, and your seven city, uh, your, your, uh, your, your city, Rome, seated on those seven hills. Now, likewise, other, quote, Historians, geographers, and poets all speak of the city with seven hills. And passages might be quoted to this purpose without number and without end. It is observed, too, that New Rome, or Constantinople, is situated on seven hills, but these are very rarely mentioned, and mentioned only by obscure authors in comparison to the others. And besides the seven hills, other patriarch, uh, other particulars, excuse me, other particulars also must coincide, which cannot be found in Constantinople. It is evident, therefore, that the city, quote, seated on seven mountains, unquote, must be Rome. And a plainer description could not be given of it without expressing the name, which there might be several reasons for concealing. Unquote. And we might also remember that these words were written by John, the apostle, the prophet of God, in prison on the island of Patmos by the Roman emperors. And he spoke in code so that his message would reach the churches and it would put neither him nor the churches at risk. So he chose divinely prepared words to describe his captors and to describe 
the city that would eventually be the rise of Antichrist. God, in his infinite wisdom, saw the ending from the beginning and got the message to his people without putting them at risk. Now, the author continues, of course, there are some Catholic apologists who say that Rome is not built on one of the seven hills. Well, it is true that the original walls of the city of the Caesars, which were built between seven, or excuse me, 272 and 279 A.D. by Aurelian, did not include the area of Vatican Hill, which is situated on the west bank of the Tiber. However, after the sacking of St. Peter's and of Rome by the Muslim Saracens in 846 A.D., Pope Leo IV, between 848 and 852, repaired and enlarged the city walls as a defensive measure. Thus, Leo IV, in fortifying Vatican Hill against future attacks, thereby included it within the perimeter of the newly reinforced city walls. The remains of these fortifications can still be, still be seen today around Vatican City and the rest of the city of Rome. This fact is confirmed by the Catholic Encyclopedia. Quote, Between 848 and 852, Leo IV surrounded the whole Vatican settlement with a wall, which included it within the city boundaries. Until the pontificate of Sixtus V, who reigned from 1585 to 1590, this section of Rome remained a private papal possession and was entrusted to a special administration. Sixtus, however, placed it under the jurisdiction of the urban authorities as the 14th region, unquote. Today, the entire city of Vatican City is within the area called, quote, the Seven Hills, unquote. It should be noted also that the seven heads of the beast in Revelation chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, have another signification, and I will just add one that prior to reading this book I'd never heard before, and I'm considering it. He says, The seven heads of the beast in Revelation chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, have another signification. Not only do they refer to the seven mountains or hills on which the metropolis of the beast is situated, but also to the seven successive orders or kinds of government. For instance, kings, consuls, dictators, tribunes, decemvirs, emperors, the kingdom of the Goths in Italy, and when at last the empire of Justinian was reduced to a point, he handed over power to the bishop of Rome. For the Roman historian Tacitus, in Annals Book 1, Chapter 1, expressly says, quote, Rome was first governed by king, then by consuls, by dictators, by decemvirs, by military tribunes, with consular authority. After these seven forms became extinct, the popedom appeared in all its rigor and has continued ever since as the eighth head of the beast. And here, included on this page, is a picture of St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, and the caption reads, A city of seven hills and the home of, of the popedom, State of Vatican City. The short history of this matter is as follows, says the author. Quote, there was the regnal period of the kings. He's still talking about these seven heads or seven forms of government. And it says, during the period of the Roman kingdom, the king of Rome was the principal executive magistrate. He was the chief priest, lawgiver, judge, and sole commander of the army. From the time of the kings to the establishment of the republic in 509 B.C., seven kings reigned. By name, Romulus, Numa Pompilius, Tullus Hostilius, Ancus Mar Marcius, L. 
Tertinius Priscus, Servius Tullius, and L. Tertinius Suburb, uh, Superbus. The transition from the monarchy to the republic was a sudden one, the outcome of a revolution. This was followed by a system where the supreme power was placed in the hands of two magistrates, the consuls, elected for the same term of office. New consuls were elected every year. There were two consuls, and they ruled together. The system of consuls did prove a workable one, although the Romans found it wise a few years after the founding of the Republic to modify it slightly by establishing the dictatorship. In 494, the patricians proposed a compromise with the, uh, the plebeians that the latter should be allowed to elect annual off. Uh, uh, excuse me, should be allowed to elect annual officials, perhaps five in number, with sufficient power to protect them against the autocratic action of the consuls. The new officials took their title Tribuni Plebis, or Tribunals. And then the tribunals and the consuls existed side by side until in 451 A.D., when a compromise between the plebeians and the upper class, that is, the patricians, was arranged to the effect that the consuls and the tribunes should alike give place to a commission of ten men called decembers and who would exercise the function of chief magistrates as well as to publish a code of laws defining the principles of Roman administration binding on the whole community. When the Decemvirate's term of office expired, the Decemviri refused to leave office. An uprising against the Decemvirate saw, uh, saw the Decemviri resigning their offices in 449 B.C., and the ordinary magistrates, the consuls, were reinstituted. But the plebes felt that they were not protected and demanded and secured the restoration of the tribunate and certain rights of the Roman leaders Valerius and Horatius secured for them. Thus, in 449 B.C., another law then established the tribunate on a surer basis than ever. Then much later, 85 years before Christ was born, L. Cornelius Sulla, by legislation, made himself dictator for an indefinite period with the express purpose of reforming the Constitution. But in 71 A.D., after a brilliant and victorious military campaign of only six months, Crassus returned to Rome to secure an election to the consulship in 70 B.C. In 70 BC Pompey and Crassus were elected to the consulship in return for the repeal of the obnoxious Sulan Laws. I say, on the history of this chapter, uh, chapter 22, seven kings, five are fallen. Again, the author likens these seven heads to seven forms of government that ruled over Rome. And we'll just take it under advisement and see what history will reveal about them. Now... He continues under the heading Vatican, or Old Hag. He says, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia Online, quote, the territory on the right bank of the Tiber between Monte Mario and Giancolo, that is, Janic Janiculum, was known to antiquity as the Agar, or the land, Vaticanus, and owing to its marshy character, the low-lying portion of this district enjoyed an ill repute. The origin of the name Vaticanus is uncertain, unquote. However, according to a Vatican curator, quote, the Vatican Hill takes its name from the Latin word Vaticanus, or Vat Vaticinus ferendus, an allusion to oracles or divinations, or Vaticinia, which were anciently delivered here, unquote. The author, Olus Gallius, 
written in the second century, tells us that the word Vatican was derived from vaticinia, or prophecies which took place there, unquote. Now, if we look up the word Vatican in the most Latin English, English Latin dictionaries, or in any other good encyclopedia, we will read that Vatican City and St. Peter's Basilica were built upon the Vaticanus Mons, or the Vaticanus Colus. Mons and Colus both mean a hill, or a... you'll also find the words Vatic, va, uh, Vates, that is V A T E S, probably more correctly pronounced Vates. Vatus all relate to prophecy as shown here, and it gives them uh, gives a list of them, and I will try to read them. It's a little difficult. The print is as a little bit smeared here, but Vatis means a seer or a prophet or a bard, a poet or a prophetess or a poetess. Vaticanus. Uh, Vatis, uh, Vatisam, or Vatican, me, uh, means Vaticanus Hill in Rome on the right bank of the Tiber. And uh, <clears throat> the other one, Vaticinatio Onus, means prophesying, or soothsaying, or prophecy. And it goes on, others uh, derived from the word Vatican are prophet and seer. Again, prophecy or foretelling a prophecy or to keep harping on or to prophesy or to rant and rave or talk wildly. In other words, Vaticanus or Vaticanus Mons simply means the hill of divination. Again, marking it for what it really is. It's not a holy city, and it's not an eternal city. It's of the devil, and it's destined for destruction. That much we know God has revealed to us. Now, let us now apply our wisdom. The word Vatic and its association to prophecy can be found in the Standard English Dictionary. A vat is a noun, a large tub or cask for storing or, storing or holding liquids. Vatic means prophetic or oracular, uh, uh, that is, proceeding from the mouth. Vatican the official papal residence, the papal government, and Vatican City, independent papal state within Rome, Italy, population 723. And this is, the source for these definitions are from Webster's Two New Riverside Dictionary, published in 1995 by Longmeadow Press, 1988. And here is what you will find in a Latin-English dictionary for the suffix anus which is the latter, uh, the, the ending of the word Vaticanus. Here's what anus means. Old woman or hag. Also an adjective from common nouns urbanus of, uh, of the city, from place names Romanus or of Rome, and from personal names like Claude. Claudia, uh, Claudianus and Claudius. And this, this also from uh, the New College Latin English Dictionary. And it says, Vaticanus then is a combination of the word Vatic, V-A-T-I-C, and Annus, just as Romanus is a combination of Rome plus Annus. Therefore, Vaticanus Colus or Vaticanus Mons means the prophetic hill or mountain, which can be rephrased as the hill or mountain of prophecy. The word Vatican is merely a shortened form of Vaticanus, like Claudian is a shortened form of Claudianus, as shown above. And it means old hag or witch 
or fortune teller. And this, for my regular listeners, is the very reason why I liken the city of Rome and the church of the Roman Catholic Church, I link her to the witch at Endor in Second Samuel. It is my belief, and you can check this out for yourself, I believe that the story of the witch at Endor in Second Samuel is simply a type to describe for us her prophetic archetype, the Roman Catholic Church. And what did the witch at Endor do? She conjured up a familiar spirit, a demon in the likeness of the prophet Samuel. And this demon, posing as a prophet of God, deceived the king of Israel, Saul. And the end of which was his life. God forbid his people and his law to consult witches and sorcerers. And after ordering the destruction of all the witches in Israel, when faced with a critical situation in battle, he sought, rather than seeking the face of God in his wisdom, he sought the only remaining witch, and, her, and she was at Endor. And she called, she cons, he consulted her wearing a disguise. And he sought information from the dead prophet Saul, uh, Samuel. And the witch at Endor, or rather Satan himself, brought up a demon that looked all the world like Samuel. And history is going to repeat itself. This witch in Rome is going to conjure up a demon that is going to deceive the whole world. And has she not already done so? With all these Marian apparitions around the world, with all these 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 uh, the so-called prophets that are heard from and prophesied from the Roman Catholic Church, all false all false prophets, every single one. She is the witch of divination, the hill of prophesying, and fulfillment of Scripture. The witch at Endor is the likeness of Rome. And I just leave it to my listeners to, to read the, the account in Second Samuel about the witch at Endor and consider for yourself what you've learned about the Vatican Hill and about the, the Roman Catholic Church and her divination. Now, continuing with the book, it says a Catholic book published in 1998 and written by none other than Nino Lobello confirms this, stating, quote, The name Vatican was given to a hillside in the west bank of the Tiber River in Rome because of the daily lineups of fortune tellers that would hawk their wares there to passers-by in the streets, unquote. That very place now, Lobello tells us, became the seat of the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. It is most curious, too, that coins minted in Vatican City from 1955 to 1965 under three different popes have the inscription on the reverse side in Latin, Sit del Vaticano, which wisdom in Revelation chapter 17, verse 9, has now shown us means the city of prophecy. And I would correct to say that is the city of false prophecy. False prophet. Risen by the power of Satan himself. For the dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority. You know, when you first learn the elements of the equation, the math becomes pretty easy to do after all, isn't it? We'll do some more math on the program tomorrow. Thanks for listening. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. See you tomorrow. 